Welcome to the Manifestation Lab. This is your host, Kelly Howe. From the grounded science to the mystical and unseen, we're investigating this big experiment we call life and finding what really works when it comes to manifesting a life that sets your heart and your soul on fire. Welcome to the lab. Okay, I want to start today's podcast off a little bit differently than I normally do. I want you to stop whatever you're doing just for a few seconds, maybe 30 seconds, and I want you to put your attention to something that you're grateful for. What is that thing that you're feeling really grateful for? And allow yourself to really connect with it. Experience it. What does that gratitude feel like in your body? Now, here's my question. When you connect with the gratitude, when you connect with that thing that you are grateful for, do you actually feel an energetic shift? If the answer is no, you're really going to want to listen to this conversation. The idea behind gratitude is to shift how we're feeling. If you create a gratitude journal, if you can look at your life and say that you're grateful and think gratitude, but not actually feel it, there's something in the way. Today, my guest is Lori Seitz. She's the founder and CEO of zenrabbit.com and host of the podcast, Fine is a Four-Letter Word. I knew I wanted to talk to Lori when I saw her website and I saw that her program is entitled Fuck Being Fine. You guys know the F word is like one of my favorite things. I'm trying to improve, maybe not saying it every five seconds, but you guys, fuck it. I just really love that word. Lori works with a lot of high achieving entrepreneurs and business leaders. And we talk a lot today about what it looks like. I've talked about this on other podcasts as well, but what it looks like when high achievers are just going, 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 they never stop. They try to carve out time for self-care and they just consistently get off track and what they need to do to really slow down. Lori has a wonderful, I think she said it's an eight week program to help people really carve out some white space, create space in their life so that they can connect with that gratitude, get into a meditation practice and really raise that vibration. Because the key to manifestation is not thinking gratitude. It's not thinking what you want to achieve. It is actually feeling it right now in this present moment. That does two things. Physically, it starts to shift our biochemistry So when we actually feel excited, when we feel joy, we actually start to shift our inner world. Our body starts to change. We upregulate well-being and we downregulate things like inflammation. Now, I know that seems really simple, but the truth is it actually is. If you can feel differently, if you can laugh, you're changing your biochemistry. It's actually really cool. The second side of this is that As we feel that joy, as we feel that gratitude, we actually let ourselves elevate into that space. We we raise our energy and we rise up energetically. And from that place, we become incredibly magnetic. So it works on both sides. It's not one or the other. You are going to really enjoy our conversation. Um, Lori and I both have, you know, really similar, I think, missions and passions as far as helping people transform and actually getting them out of the chaos and getting into the peace, no matter what is going on. So here's Lori, sit back and enjoy. Hey. Hello, Kelly. How are you? Well, thanks. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm going to go grab my water really quickly. I thought I had all my beverages, but let me call you right back. No worries. Right back. It's already poured and everything. I'm like a camel. I have to have water with me at all times. Oh, well, that's healthy. It's good. It's good. Yes. So welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah. Lori, I'm so excited to talk to you. I, um, when I came across your website and the first thing I saw was fuck being fine. <laughs> I was like, this is my people. I'm good. (laughs) Like we need to talk. (laughs) I have to tell you, I've been for the last like three years, I've been considering naming my book. Um, you're not fucking fine. So I was like, yes, we are on the same wavelength. (laughs) Oh, I love it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So why don't we start there? You know, talk to me about, so you're the CEO of Zen rabbit. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Um, what is Zen rabbit? What is it? Where did the name come from? Yeah. What is Zen rabbit? I love it. So the names that I, I started my first company in 2003. 
And I was marketing, making and marketing a product called the gratitude cookie that was based on a family recipe, kind of a cross between a butter and a sugar cookie. And because I have a background in marketing, my idea was not to just be the next Mrs. Fields. That wasn't my goal, was to create a product for a way for businesses, a tool for businesses to say thank you to their clients and people who sent them referrals. Oh, yeah. And so that's what I created the whole gratitude cookie thing. And so the name Zen Rabbit, it was Zen Rabbit Baking Company at that point. Oh, that's so cute. Because when I was an infant, my mom got me a stuffed rabbit and put it in the crib with all the other animals and quickly realized that she could take all the other animals out. But if the rabbit wasn't in the crib, I wasn't sleeping. And as I got older, there's a picture on my website too of me holding the rabbit and rubbing her ears. And she would put me in this Zen meditative state. Oh. And so when I was doing the cookies, people would say, oh my gosh, these are so good. This tastes like something I would bake in the kitchen with grandma. And it brought them back to this Zen bliss, blissful place of baking with grandma. And so I named the company Zen Rabbit. And then from, again, from a marketing standpoint and a branding standpoint, nobody ever forgets the name Zen Rabbit. No, they don't. Yeah. And so- after I closed that down, I couldn't quite scale that business the way I wanted to. And I closed it after 11 years of really struggling to make it work. Mm-hmm. And, and when I came time to start my next entrepreneurial venture, mm-hmm. I came back to the name Zen Rabbit. I tried to name it something different, but people still associated me with Zen Rabbit. So I went, fine. All right, the company's still called Zen Rabbit, just informally Zen Rabbit 2.0, and we're probably on 3.0 now. So I love it. Yeah, it's just evolving over time. Yeah. No, I really, really love it. I saw it and I was like, okay, first of all, that's just the cutest name. But I thought after I started looking at what you do, and I know you work with a lot of high achieving entrepreneurs, mm-hmm. there is this kind of need for taking that like really almost frenetic rabbit energy that goes so fast yeah. and like goes, 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 and bringing the Zen to it. So I yeah. thought, yeah. Oh, that's just so adorable. I love it. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Well, now I'm bringing them Zen. Yeah. The Zen calm. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about what, you know, what you do. Do you call yourself a coach? I'm not a big fan of that word. Struggle with that. Yeah. That's okay. Well, tell me why. Because everybody calls themselves a coach. And what does that even mean anymore? Mm-hmm. So I see myself more as a guide or a mentor almost, but Mm -hmm. I mean, I know mentors don't get paid and I do, but, (laughs) (laughs) but in that kind of role where I, I just tend to ask a lot of questions and help people get to the answers on their own. And I know that that is sort of a coach role, but I just consider myself more kind of a, of a guide. Yeah, I totally get it. I I call myself a coach also, but Really, I my background is in nursing. So I did 10 years in nursing and kind of over the last couple of years, I found tapping or EFT. Are mm-hmm. you familiar with that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it it worked so fast for me and it was such rapid shift. And um, it was like everything I had been looking for. And I felt mm. it worked so quickly that I got obsessed with it and just had to learn everything I could. So I transitioned into being like a, a tapping practitioner because I have never taken a business or marketing class. I just knew I was like, people need to know about this. I'm a nurse. I help people like, this is what I do. Um, and then, so I went through like a couple of years of being like, what do I call myself? What, what is this? Because I really feel like I'm a guide. I'm a coach. I'm a mentor. I'm a healer. You know, I'm a confidant, um, all those things. So I completely say that I 100% get it. And, um, it's, I ended up landing on the word coach just for like lack of a better term. <laughs> right. Because, because that's what people can relate to. Yeah. And you have exactly. to speak in terms that you're the people you're working to help. Yeah. Can understand. Yeah. Because someone's saying, what are you doing now? And I'm like, oh, I'm a tapping practitioner. They're like, what is that? And then yeah. you try to explain what tapping is. And then like people's eyes glaze over <laughs> <laughs> and they're like falling asleep in their chair or they're just like walk away. <laughs> yeah, like, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> oh my gosh. So if somebody, if somebody, you know, is a higher, high achieving, high achieving, sorry, my words aren't coming out, but they're high achieving entrepreneur, one of those kind of like, go, 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 go. What does it look like when you bring them into your support system? Um, What does that look like? It looks like taking everything down a couple of notches as far as peace and calm. You know, a lot of people say they're trying to find peace in their life 
peace of mind. And some people actually are trying to find it or diligently looking for it and are willing to step into it. Other people, it's interesting because people say they want calm, but then they're not willing to do whatever it is because they're so addicted to the drama. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, I want calm. Wait, did you see that car accident? Like, like in the back. same sentence sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> so the people who are who really are seeking it are open to the recommendations that I have. And I use the concepts of gratitude and meditation as my prime mm, sources of helping people find that calm. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing because I love talking about gratitude because we're now we're talking about energetic vibration, not just oh yeah, I'm grateful. You know, I have a list of things I'm grateful for, which I don't even keep people ask me. I don't keep a gratitude list. I don't do a journal every day because it just feels like another thing on my to-do list. And that's not the feeling you want for this. Right. I completely so, agree. <laughs> yeah. So, but getting into that feeling of gratitude is what's really important because that's where, I'm sure you know this, you raise your energetic vibration. And when you are energetically charged, the gratitude and love are the highest energetic vibrations you can get to. And that's when you become magnetic, if you will, to attracting the, the more good things. Like the more you are grateful for, the more the universe gives you to be grateful for. And this is not woo-woo stuff. This is science and research behind how this works. Yes, totally agree. So do you find that you have people come to you sometimes that are like, well, but I'm already grateful. I have this, I wrote down these things and I'm mm. so grateful for this. And they kind of give you this like, you know, grocery list of the things they're grateful for, but like, there's no energy behind it. Yeah. How do you, yeah. And I find that too. And I think that that's one of the places where there was kind of like um, a misconception or it was maybe even just taught wrong in, yeah. in the personal development space that like. All you have to do is just think grateful thoughts, but it's really, I'm, I'm so with you. It's not just thinking it. It's if you don't feel behind it, you're not actually harnessing the power of that energy and becoming that magnet for those things. So if somebody comes to you and they're like, no, no, I'm already grateful. You know, how would you start that conversation? I mean, maybe it's just exactly yeah. what you told me, but. Well, it's interesting because I was, I was working with a business coach who had issues around the whole gratitude thing because he, he just couldn't get himself to, to get into that space of feeling it. And it wasn't until recently I heard somebody say that that feeling of great gratitude, like, what are you joyful? What can you feel joyful about? And it kind of backing people into great gratitude through feeling joyful, because it's the kind of the same, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But I think it's easier for people to remember how it feels to be joyful, like bring a memory bring up a memory of a time when you were joyful. Mm -hmm. And that's what gratitude feels like. Oh, I love that. That's so simple and so smart. <laughs> and such a such a really like baseline way to get people to kind of connect that that vibration and that energy and get into that space. I really really love that. So, Laura, you actually just published a book recently, right? Fine as a four letter word. Uh, Is that fine. your book and your podcast? It is my podcast, Fine is a Four-Letter okay. Word, and it is a chapter in a collaborative book I contributed to. Okay. Yeah, and it's my chapter. Okay. So what is what does the chapter entail in that book? Uh, it's actually the story of my month-long road trip sabbatical that I took Oh, back in August of 2022. Okay. Tell me about because, that. So a I month -long, have- Month-long road trip? A month-long road trip sabbatical- with a 19 year old cat. <gasps> oh my gosh. Okay. Please tell me. So your cat likes being in the car. She was the best traveler. Yeah. I, so I lost my 18 year old cat a couple years ago and I'm thinking of him at that age. Your cat, is she still with you? No, no. So, yeah. I, this is part of the reason I took her. Like I knew I wasn't. So she passed about three weeks after we got back from the road trip and I knew. So she had kidney disease because most cats at that age do. And she required sub Q fluids twice a week. So, and I had talked to my animal communicator friend and she, before I went, like I was trying to figure out how I'm going to make this whole thing work. And she said, Panther would rather be with you than anywhere else. I'm like, okay, I guess I'm taking this trip with the cat. 
And <laughs> she, and I knew she was a good traveler because we had done a, some cross country road trips and it was the best, best experience for both of us. I mean, she loved it. So back up just a little bit, what was happening right before yeah. you're like, I'm just going to jump in the car for a month with my 19 year old cat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all the first half of last year was, I mean, I look at my calendar now and it's time blocked and I just, my head wants to explode just looking at it of all the stuff I had packed in and I'm teaching people how to stay calm and grounded and be connected to gratitude and practice meditation. And I practice meditation every day. It's part of my morning routine. And yet still, I was feeling overwhelmed and starting to get burned out because I was doing so many things. And on top of doing all those things, not seeing the results that I would have expected mm. in my business from doing all the things. So mm -hmm. I, as many of my high achieving entrepreneurial colleagues would do, double down and do more of them. Mm -hmm. They're not working, but maybe if I do the more, they'll, they'll <laughs> yeah. work. More, more, more. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, sitting at my computer from nine in the morning until 1030 at night, in part because I live alone at the time with the cat. And uh, what else am I going to, I might as well just keep working. That's not healthy. There's no mm -hmm. time to recharge your battery. Yeah. And so I had a few conversations with people who were talking about taking sabbaticals and it started out as, oh, I'm like kind of envious. I could never do that. I don't know how I could do that. And then I finally started thinking, well, okay, I'm doing all the things, um, not getting the results I want and I'm not having fun. Like it would be different if I was really in having fun doing all this stuff, but it was wearing me down. And I, well, what if I just stopped? Like, what if I just went and pursued having fun and finding joy? Because the things I'm doing aren't quote unquote working anyway. So right. Hell, I'm just going to go. I've tried doing more of it over yeah. and over again. Yeah. It's not working. So I just took off and well, I had sort of a plan uh, and went and visited friends that was somewhat determined by who would let me stay at their place with the cat and, <laughs> <laughs> and just went and had fun. I took, I stayed with friends. I, we took a pickleball like us. I never played pickleball before, but we took a class and it was super fun. So fun. Paddle yeah. boarding. I ended, I was down in South Florida. Um, eventually I got down to South Florida. So paddle boarding, uh, pickleball, like really good bagels, like nice. lots of fun things to do. And then, um, yeah. And then I took some time, just the two, the two of us, Panther and I went to the West coast of Florida and rented a super cute cottage Aww. that had a little courtyard area. She could go out in and watch the lizards and eat some plants. And it was, it was amazing. So the cool thing about this road trip is yes, I was relaxing. I wasn't doing any work. Literally sitting on the beach and two of the biggest business opportunities to ever come my way showed up. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And that's how it works. Mm -hmm. When you're not trying to push a rock up a hill all the time and you allow ease and flow. Ironically, my, my phrase for last year was ease and flow and I wasn't even doing it, but that's what I eventually found my way into. That's when amazing things start showing up in your life. Yes. Because you were able to take the break, you focused on having fun and it raised your energy and your vibration went up. It yep. felt better. You got into flow. You weren't even thinking about work. And then the allowing opens up, right? Yep. That's, <laughs> Isn't that it's, amazing? It's yes, it's amazing. And it's so, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like counter intuitive. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Cause again, high achievers think I have to work hard to succeed. We have been brainwashed with this stupid freaking message yes. practically since birth. And it's a lie. Yes, I agree. I, and I find that there's, it's not only a belief that's, I think just like thousands of years old that we've just been pushing, 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 but there's this old ass energy 
of guilt and shame wrapped up in it that we're yep. dealing with in this life and like in our ancestry. And it takes a while for people, at least I've found it takes a while for people to really wrap their head around it, but then also to like offload the emotion behind, yeah. because I, you know, I know that I dealt with that too, and still do at times if I really give myself enough white space and I'm like, mm-hmm. I feel so good. And then all of a sudden I'm like, boom, I should be doing something. I should yep. be doing something. And now I know, right. So I can be playful with it and kind of laugh about it, but I'm sure that you see that too. Yeah. All the time. And something I still work on too. Yeah. Yeah. It, I, you know, I think that's why we need coaches co- or people to help keep us in the, in the right lane mm-hmm. so that when we do start getting off and off track, meaning not allowing, not playing, not having fun to go, Hey, Hey, hey come back. What right. are you going to do for fun? Come back to me. Come yeah. back over here. <laughs> right. Let's talk this through. It's way too easy to to think, well, if I'm not working, I'm not productive. I don't have value. First of all, that's where that all starts. Mm-hmm. That that productivity and achievement is tied to our value in the world. Uh, but yeah, oh my gosh, like the worst thing in the world would be to be a slacker. So, oh, right. <laughs> so I better keep working because I don't want to be that. Exactly. Oh my gosh. It's funny too. Cause like so many women, not everyone, but I feel like it, it, that slacker can become like a shadow quality where it's like the thing we never want to be. And then once we burn out and then we're like total slacker mode, we're like, just can't make ourselves do anything for a while. And it's just, it's a funny, you know, it's just a funny cycle we get ourselves yeah. into. It's like the thing we can't stand, but it's like, if we could just carve out a little bit of lazy time here and there, we don't have to get into burnout and then be like, you know, doing right. nothing. Right. Exactly. Well, so what I learned on my sabbatical was I had a conversation with a, a friend at lunch one day and he said, I feel like I already lived the sabbatical life. Like I, this is what I was talking about in my chapter. Um, the book is called love warriors, by the way. Oh, and okay. Yeah. Uh, and I, that triggered a light bulb in my head. And I went, ah, yes, living the sabbatical life. And so I brought that back and it started incorporating some of that. It may become its own program at some point, but how to live the sabbatical life without having to go on a month long road trip with a cat or a year. Some people I've talked to have taken year, a year off and that's cool. I mean, all good if you can do that. Not everybody has the ability to do that. So how can you live the sabbatical life every day? And it involves allowing yourself to recharge every day. And recharging is not sitting in front of the TV. That can be relaxing, but it's not recharging. And so, you know, shutting your computer off at whatever time you say you're going to do it and then taking time to recharge your battery. Because it's like, you know, with your cell phone, it's on low battery mode. You can't just leave it on low battery mode and come back tomorrow morning and expect it to be back at a hundred percent if you didn't plug it in and recharge it. Mm-hmm. That's what we do to ourselves though. Oh, over and over. Yeah. <gasps> so if you have somebody that's like really clinging to just like, go, 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 where do you have them start with if like almost if they don't even understand what recharging means, you yeah. know? Yeah. It, it, this I've had this discussion so many times and it's really difficult for people, but what is it that you enjoy doing? And that's a hard question to answer when you have never paid, when you have not paid attention to it for so long. Mm-hmm. What do you love doing? Is it playing tennis, swimming, you, puzzles? What? Yeah. It's about digging in and finding what brings you joy, like really joy. Yeah. I find that with the people that are really stuck on that, I say, just ask the universe for a sign to bring you something, you know, that kind of drops in and just notice if you feel any bump in energy and it just feels a little bit better. Cause sometimes I do get people that are just, it's been shut down for so long. They're like, I don't even know. I don't know what's fun. I don't, I don't know what's pleasurable. And then the other thing that I love to do with people is to have them and I don't know if you do this, like visualize going back to being maybe like four, three yeah. or four years old. And I'm like, what do they like to do? Right. You know, what are they doing? Are they playing in the mud? Are they running around? Are they dancing? Are they drawing? Are they putting on makeup? Are they dressing up? You know, and yeah. I feel like it, that's an easier way for people, even if they don't like specifically remember, they can kind of get into that curiosity of like, what would a three or four year old 
like yeah. really have fun doing. Yeah. Yeah. I remember I was playing Barbies. <laughs> yes, me too. And like I had Ken and like the should car. I go, and... Should I go get some now? <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. I mean, I guess, I guess we do outgrow some of that stuff, but, um, but I do still like coloring. Like that yeah, and I, mm-hmm. is relaxing and recharging for me. Yeah, exactly. And like, I wouldn't play with Barbies now, but I, but I think I play with Barbies in my head as far as like, um, curating, curating situations and like in creative visioning sort Mm -hmm. of, you know, like how could things work out? Um, so yeah, I just think that's a fun way to kind of like tap back into that energy and, and people think I'm crazy, but I'm like, if you love to dance when you were little, like turn the music on in the kitchen and dance while you're cooking and see how it feels. And they come back and they're like, okay, you're right. That felt amazing. And I'm like, "Uh uh-huh, do more of it. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Right. Well, and it just moving the body recharges energy and brings those good feelings into, into your physical being. Definitely. Definitely. So I see here that you, you grew up, wait, so you're living in like kind of outside of Washington DC now. Mm -hmm. Is that, did you grow up in that area? No, no. Where are you from? (laughs) I grew up in New Jersey, but I got out as soon as I could. Jersey and Jersey. I got out as soon as I could. (laughs) Like I'm out of here. Yeah. That's right. (laughs) So how did you, like you told the story of the little rabbit and you're rubbing his ears. So you always had some sort of, I don't know, method to tap into that kind of Zen. Yes. Well, right. So that started from an early age. Mm-hmm. the Zen rabbit, although I didn't call her that at the time, but yes. But that's what she was. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mom took my brother and me to a meditation course when I was 10. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's now known as the Silva method. Oh, wow. Cool. Are you familiar? I am. Could you talk about the Silva method and what that is? And then I want to hear more of the story. <laughs> yeah. Well, so it was, uh, the course she took us to was, it was the Silva method four kids. Like it was a couple of weekends and there were other kids in this course with us. I would us. totally, I would totally take my kids to that if I could find one. Yeah. I don't know if they still, I know they still teach the Silva method. I don't know if they have a kid's version of it mm-hmm. at this point, but I mean, it was still, the, it was the same thing they were teaching to adults. It just was a class of kids. And so I had that foundation, but I didn't really use it over the next 40 years. I would mm-hmm. practice meditation once in a while. I would start meditating for like a week maybe, and then I'd skip a few years and then come back to it. And I didn't get back into it consistently until I would say probably right after my mom passed away, which was almost nine years ago. And funny enough, the meditation that brought me back into being consistent was Vishen Lakiani's six-phase meditation. Oh, okay. Vision, if for people who are listening who don't know, Vision is the founder of Mind Valley. Mm-hmm. And Mind Valley, and he talks in his book, The Code of the Extraordinary Mind, about how he got into meditation and it was actually the Silva method. You know, I actually, my introduction to the Silva method was through Mind Valley. And that was a long, long right. time ago. So yeah. Right. Because now Mind Valley is the uh I don't know what to say. Like Jose Silva passed away and his daughter, Laura continued, but Mind Valley is, uh, they are the ones, I don't know how to say, like, they don't own it, but they, they promote it, I guess. Promote they it. They, it. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. under their umbrella now. Okay. Yeah. So it's been a long time. And it's funny because I was just thinking of the Silva method not long ago and thinking, I really need to like pull those audios back out, pull those mm-hmm. books back out. Um, but, but from what I remember, it is a lot of meditative practices, yeah. a lot of tuning in inside to what you're feeling, tuning into what you're sensing. And it's also kind of, from what I remember, it's a manifestation process. Yeah. 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 Well, it's all of those things. There are different ex- exercises for all of those things. So not every meditation is going to be a visualization. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and there's a, there are so many different techniques within the Silva method that you can use. There's one for coming up from problem solving, like asking yourself the question that you're trying to look for an answer for, find an answer for before you fall asleep and letting your subconscious mind bring you the the answer. Yes. I'm trying to remember. I remember one like that where it's like, I think you ask the question and like drink half of the water. Mm -hmm. 
That's is that right? Before Am you I go remembering to sleep. this? Yep. I haven't thought of this in years. And I'm yeah. like, this, I'm so glad we're talking about this because I really need to pull that stuff back out. But you like ask a question, drink half of the water, go to sleep, let your subconscious figure it out. And then you drink the rest of the water in the morning. Is that yeah, right? And then, right. And then answers show up to you Start maybe to throughout fall. the day. It may be when you first wake up, it comes to you or throughout the day you stay aware. And like you were talking about earlier, looking for signs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And okay. then there's, the, there's like a mirror of the mind, which is a visualization technique. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I totally need to pull this back out. So you're 10 years old and you're at this workshop. Were you, I mean, when you went, were you like, yay, I'm excited to be here. Or were you kind of like, what is my mom having me do? Well, she had been through it herself. And then she also made my dad go, but he never really, he was like, yeah, I don't believe in this. But to this day, he does not. He, he didn't come around. Buy into it. No, no. <laughs> uh, I I thought it was pretty cool. And so I was there with my brother and our three f- friends who were neighbors, their mom had put them in this course too. So the five of us were in there with some other kids. But yeah, yeah I, I thought it was cool. And I think especially kids when you're, when you're young, especially like this isn't weird to you at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was just telling somebody last night, it was doing a consult, um, for her daughter. I hardly ever talk to people in the evening, but it was just one of those situations where I was. And I was telling her that, you know, just start opening up this language a little bit about intuition Mm -hmm. and just dropping little seeds here and there. And I said, because she's young enough, I think she's going to remember and yeah. she's, it's going to light something up inside of her head. That's going to be like, okay, that I remember something about that. And I can see myself as a child going to a workshop like that. I didn't, um, start that kind of thing till much later, but I could see myself being timid and kind of being like, oh my gosh, what the heck am I doing here? But I, I really think that if I had sat there and listened, it probably would have just, I would have started to remember like, yeah. oh yeah, this is true. This all makes sense. Um, all the, all the other times in our lives, when all the other lives that we've lived yeah, and, and played with that same kind of energy and magic, I think it would have come back pretty quickly. Yeah. And exactly what you were just talking about is about is planting those seeds that was in there forever after, even when I wasn't practicing meditation formally, there were things in there. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't even think, do you remember the cancel, cancel part of things when you, I when you don't. hear something negative? or you hear somebody say something negative, like uh, whatever it is, then you cancel it in your mind, like by saying cancel, cancel, like that happens naturally. I don't even think about that from that, from then. Oh, I really freaking love that. I can't <laughs> believe I don't remember it, but apparently it needed maybe, to drop Maybe your teacher awareness. didn't teach you that part. I don't know. <laughs> well, I listened. I mean, it was like when Mind Valley first started, I don't know uh-huh. how long ago that was. So, um, they sent me some little booklets and then it was like recorded audios. Yeah. And I think that the MP3s were like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know where those audios are, but I know I have the books, but it was just a long time ago. So yeah. I wasn't yeah. with an instructor because I live in Missouri and I don't think there's anybody around here teaching the Silva method. I don't know. You could look it up. Not. Yeah. At least there wasn't when I first started. I probably did look it up all those years ago. And um, yeah, there might be now because things are spreading like wildfire. So what is, what is your meditation practice look like now? It looks like, so I tend to most frequently use an app called Insight Timer. Okay, and it's a free app that can be downloaded. There's a paid version, but I only have the free version. You still have access to 160,000 meditations. Wow. Gra- uh, guided, music only. Like there's a ton, obviously there's a lot of meditations and a lot of different versions or, you know, you can find one on anxiety or sleep or uh, grounding or whatever, like search on a whole bunch of parameters. So I typically listen to a meditation from there, not always the same one. And Vision's six phase meditation is on there. Okay. That's not where I had originally found it, but it is on there. Uh, yeah, so I will start my day by listening to a guided meditation, uh, typically a guided meditation. And at this point, it's become such a habit. Like I feel weird if I don't do it every morning. Yeah, oh, I can yeah. I can totally understand that. And then I most just 
really just recently, like past couple of weeks, one of my business partners teaches breath work. He's creating a course. He's mostly worked with people one-on-one or small groups. And now he's creating a course so that people can learn this technique without having to physically be in his space. And it's a different type of breath work. It's, it's challenging, but not as challenging as some types of breath work I've done before. Mm -hmm. And so I've started incorporating that into my morning as well. And I physically feel like I am buzzing. Okay. Really interesting. Yeah, that's cool. So is there, can you share any differences or details? I'm kind of new to breath work. I'm familiar with it. Um, So I certainly am not educated in like the different types of it. I have a friend who um, does neuromeditation and he has a meditation where there's breath work incorporated into the guided visualization kind of inside of it. You hold your breath at certain times, but I have limited exposure. So I'd just love to hear your experience. Yeah, that's kind of what uh, Leland's practice is too. So you're doing the breath work and then you're releasing it and you're just kind of sitting in a meditative state and then you go back into the breath and he does it three times through uh, breathing through your nose, then breathing through your mouth and then breathing through your mouth again, but in a different way. Mm -hmm. And the practice, the, the one I'm doing now is about 15 minutes. So yeah. And you just feel, you can just feel that buzzy energy afterwards. It's kind of like, I was looking at my hand the other day after, and I'm like, it, it's not like I have Parkinson's, but my hand is vibrating. Vibrating. Yeah. Oh, that's really, really cool. I love that. And so are you, is your mind really clear and you're just able to like lock in and go through your day and get things done the way that you want to? Or are you I, more like relaxed afterwards and just kind of I, I <laughs> zenning out? I'm, I'm still, the jury's still out on that. I mean, I okay. feel because I physically feel different when I'm finished, but that doesn't last. I mean, maybe a few minutes after that, it's not like I'm physically vibrating the rest of the day, but I understand that when you're raising your vibration that way, you are making yourself more magnetic, not Mm -hmm. just in that moment, but the rest of the day you are. And so it's about attracting again, more good things into your life. And so I will admit, I haven't been doing it every day. So, oh, you're such a slacker. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I did do it today. Oh, I'm the worst at being consistent. So, no judgment here. If I can well, do something like three days a week, I'm like, yes, I am killing it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, the meditation, like I said, I do that every day. Yeah. The breath work, I'm just getting more into being consistent with it. So, a few times a week, is it, it is challenging. It's still challenging for me yeah. to get. Yeah. I like how it feels, but not necessarily in the moment that I'm doing the breathing part of it. I like it's the almost like a workout part of it. <laughs> yeah, like a good workout. And you're yeah. like, I didn't necessarily love that while I'm in it. However, now I feel like I could like conquer the world and yeah. like yeah. manifest anything. That's well, one of the things about doing the, the actual breathing part, you get a little bit lightheaded. Mm-hmm. And that isn't necessary. Uh, for me, it's not super comfortable. Yeah, no, I'm I'm with you. I get lightheaded too in the meditations I've done. Um, and truth be told, I'm just sometimes get lightheaded just throughout my day. So <laughs> some, I mean, I really do. Like I have low blood pressure, I get low blood sugar, you know, like that that can happen. So I certainly don't want to like put myself in that situation often. Um, but I'm playing with it and trying yeah. new things. And what do you, you know, do you ever do the, just like sit down, clear your mind, like no guided meditation. And when, yeah. when do you drop that in? I typically on a weekend, cause I'll stay in it for a longer period of time, but I rarely do it in complete silence. I will put on music, healing frequency music. Yeah. Or I do by, much better by neural well. beats and, and do it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that whole complete silence, which so many people think that's meditation. Like I'm always talking about the myths and misconceptions around what meditation really is. And because so many people think it's sitting cross-legged on a mat for hours at a time in complete silence with no thoughts running through your head at all. And then I don't know about you, but that's like, sounds like hell on earth to me. (laughs) Yeah. And it's really not possible as, I mean, unless you're a monk, maybe that's been doing it forever, but that's not really what meditation is and people think they're not good at it because they think that's what 
that's the only thing meditation is. Yeah. No, I totally agree. Um, and maybe they try it because they know that they need, they know they need to slow down. They've heard meditation's helpful. And so they sit down and try to clear their mind. And then within seconds, they're distracted, they're uncomfortable. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so are there any of the other misconceptions that come to mind that you'd like to share? Because I, I love this topic. I think, I think especially for people that are kind of that like, go, go, go energy that yeah. sitting down and being still is not the place to start because exactly. I find that most of the time they hate it and they don't get a lot of benefit from it. Right. Um, or if they do get benefit from it, it's very, very short lived. And then they're right back into where they were. Yeah. Um, so, well, or yeah, it adds you, to the beating up of themselves. Cause they're like, I can't yes. clear the thoughts in my head. I'm oh terrible gosh. at this. Oh, a hundred percent. I totally agree. Well, and then it, there's like almost like a self-loathing around it. Like, or I failed at that. And it's yes. just, yeah, it can be right. so icky, but there's so many different options for meditation. Yes, exactly. So you mentioned dancing in the kitchen. One of the things that I recommend to people who have a hard time sitting still is to put on your favorite song and dance to the, like, just move, get the energy out and then sit. I totally agree. Love it. I love, love, love it. Guided meditations for sure, because you can mm -hmm. then always have something to bring your mind back to, back to the, the voice, the meditation teacher's voice, back to your breathing, back, bringing it back, bringing it back. Andrew Huberman has a podcast. Uh, I forget what it's called on Huberman. I don't know. Huberman Andrew, Lab. Yeah. Huberman, mm -hmm. Yes, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And there's an episode where he talks about meditation and focus and how actually becoming better at focusing outside of meditation is happens when, because when you are in meditation, when you are constantly bringing your mind back, so you, you catch yourself, thoughts are taking you away and you're bringing your mind back again to the sound of the meditation teacher's voice, to the music, to the breathing, that process of constantly refocusing back, refocusing back, refocusing, that makes you better able to focus when you're out of a meditation. That being able to focus makes you more efficient, effective, productive. We want to get to the, this is how meditation makes people more productive. Yeah. It is that refocusing, not the keeping the thoughts out. It's bringing your mind back every time you catch it wandering away. Yeah. Oh, I think that makes so much sense. And, and what I find is that if I do a guided meditation and specifically, if I do put sound to it, I can, I can get my vibration up so much faster yeah. Yeah. than if I just try to, I mean, I can do it when I clear my mind and I sit there, I can do it. But if I add music and I add a visualization to it, mm -hmm. um, typically I can, I can rise a lot faster. And what I find is that then at the end of the, at the guided meditation, then I'm like in this beautiful high vibration and I yep. can sit quietly yes. and it's like, I get there so much faster and then I can stay there longer. Yeah. Same, same. And then the other thing I recommend too, for people who really have a hard time sitting is go walk in nature, mm. do something that keeps you moving. It could be running. I don't recommend bringing any electronics with you when you do that. Because the I'm idea still, I'm is, still guilty of that. <laughs> well, and if you did, then I would still be listening to like a freak a healing frequency music mm -hmm. as opposed to a podcast or uh other kinds of music or news or just that constant. What you're trying to do is get quiet enough to hear your own inner voice. Because we rarely let ourselves into that space where we have so many outside voices talking to us, media, social media, traditional media, friends, family, colleagues, everybody who has their opinion of how you should be read, living your life and thinking. Mm -hmm. But what is your inner voice telling you? And unless you allow that space and that time and that, that quietness, mm -hmm. you're not going to know. And you're, you're going to always be, kind of a victim to other people's mm -hmm. beliefs and opinions about what you should be doing. Yeah. I think that we have a consumption problem. Yeah. Like, like we're always in these modes where we're consuming, consuming, consuming other people's information. Yeah. 
and it gets in the way of that voice, like you're talking about. And it's interesting because I'm, I was kind of like going on a journey over the last few years. And, um, I really started walking a lot a few years ago. I live, I live in town, but I live really close to this just amazing trail. And I would often listen to podcasts. Um, and occasionally I still can, it's almost like I have to like go with what I'm craving. And a lot of yes. times I crave, yes. I listen to a lot of like Kundalini music. Mm -hmm. And when I listen to that while I'm walking, Oh, I love that. That's so powerful. But sometimes, well, let me rewind. I used to listen to podcasts a lot, but what I noticed was it got to a point where I would just, I would be walking and my inner voice would start to come in. And I realized I wasn't listening to the podcast yes. at all which I thought was so cool. I was like, wow, it's, it's kind of like when you're driving mm -hmm. and you know, you're driving and you're, you're like, there's a part of you focused on that, Yes, <laughs> but there's another part that's totally checked out. So, uh, I think it was that point. So to your point, like it was at that point that I realized I was like, I'm not, I'm not listening to this. This isn't productive. And I started using more, um, you know, vibrational music. And, yeah. um, sometimes I just put on some Lady Gaga and like rock it out, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yes, there's nothing wrong with listening to music or podcasts when you're out walking or running or whatever. That just might not necessarily be meditative. Right. Right. Exactly. And I just find that walking, I, what I realized also, and I don't know if you do this, but like, if I'm, if I feel stuck, like I'm writing a book and, um, I'm always creating content. And if I feel stuck, if I go for a walk, it's like those ideas will start to drop in. And so I just stop right where I am and I'll just jot them down. And then mm -hmm. I just move on about my day. Yeah. And then I have the ideas and I can come back and elaborate on them later. Um, which I resisted for a long time because I kind of felt like I was interrupting my like time in nature. But I also realized I'm like, my guides can clearly talk to me right now. I need to take advantage of this. Yes. Yes. I'll do like a voice note mm -hmm. or, or write it down, but yes, either one. Uh, but do you find it difficult to get yourself to get up from your computer and go for the walk? Like I'm trying to be productive. I, I know I need to walk. I'm just going to sit here and bang it's gotten this out. better. Yeah. It's gotten better because I've gotten, I mean, really just in the last like four months, I said to my husband, at the, like before Christmas, I said, listen, I know I get weird this time of year. It's winter. Like I know I get a little bit weird. February is the worst month for me and I'm actually doing okay. So, <laughs> um, but I said, if I tell you, I'm not feeling right. I want you to tell me to go outside, even if it's just for five minutes to breathe yeah. fresh air, because I work from home. I have a home office. Um, and my oldest son drives to school now. And he, a lot of times he takes my, my middle son because they go to the same high school. Um, my youngest son rides the bus. So it's like, all of a sudden I'm not getting out of the house mm -hmm. very much. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I was like, I need fresh air and just that one little shift. And there's been a couple of times when he's like, have you been outside today? And I'll go, Oh my God, no, I haven't. And I go outside and it it is like complete shift within yeah. seconds, just getting yeah. that first breath. So I would say just in the last few months, I've it's not as hard for me because I can I can recognize mm -hmm. I'm aware that I don't feel good this time of year. I'm aware that it is hard for me to peel away from it. And I'm aware that I asked for help on the outside. <laughs> and I think the combination of those three things that it has made it easier. It's not always yeah. easy yeah. to peel away. Um, but it has been easier recently. Yeah, very cool. I I had assigned a client one time. She was spinning in whatever it was she was spinning on, mm -hmm. <laughs> overthinking things. All the things. Yeah. And right. And she's one of the ones who's like, I'm not good at meditating. I can't sit still. I said, go outside and stand with your feet on the ground and feel yourself being rooted into the earth. And like you are a tree, like everything that's happening around you is happening around you, but it's not affecting you. You're moving, you're maybe bending in the wind, but it's not, it's not pushing you over. It's not disturbing you. It's just happening. Mm -hmm. Right. And she did it and she came back in and she was like, wow, that was so cool. Amazing. Yeah. So if, if you do have those women that it's like, you're telling them build this into your day and they're having a hard time peeling away. Do you have any tricks for them to like remind themselves or, you know, anything that comes to mind? Well, for one thing, you could set an alarm on your phone. 
Yeah, to I just love that go idea. go do it. Attach or attach it to something else. Like I, you know, going to get the mail, or, uh, yeah. I again, I think it comes back to remembering how good it feels when you did it last time. Mm-hmm. Like al- and allowing yourself to have the joy of doing it again. Yeah. Um, but yeah, having somebody else remind you is a great way to do it. Well, cause yeah. you know how, um, it's, you know, like right now I feel pretty good. So I can see all the way, all the things that I need to do, but yeah. when you're in that funk, right. it's right. like, you're in like a bubble and the weirdest, most simple things aren't in our awareness. Yeah. You know? So a lot of times people joke about having Lori on speed dial, but <laughs> So they're not actually necessarily calling because they'll they'll text me mm-hmm. and I'll tell them, go outside, go do this, go do that. Like, oh yeah, okay, I, I forgot. Yeah. Or thanks for the reminder. So that's part of yeah, my exactly. clients get that. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah. And just asking for somebody to help us. And it's like the vulnerability to acknowledge that sometimes I am not okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sometimes I am not, not fine. fine. No, <laughs> I'm not fine. Not fine. <laughs> Never fine. So I would imagine that you have like, fuck being fine. That had to have come from life experience. Yes. You know, so what did life, what did life look like when, before that was born or while it was being born? Yeah. Well, before it was born, I mentioned the the baking company and not being able to scale it the way I wanted to and, or even make it profitable, even though from the outside, it looked like it was doing great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and it finally ended up shutting it down. And at the same time, that's when my mom was diagnosed with an aggressive form of leukemia. So that all happened at the same time. And that's when I started really thinking like, okay, I do I want to live the next 20 years the same way I lived the last 20? And the last 20 were not at all terrible. They were fine. There were some a lot of good times in them. For the most part, it was fine. Do I want to keep living? Fine. And... Yeah, and re reevaluated my marriage and decided to leave. After 22 years of marriage, wow. we had been together for almost 30 years. So all of my adult life and ended up leaving that and moving from Virginia to California for a year because why not? I need some distance. I need yeah. some distance and perspective. But really, I did that physical distance allowed me the perspective I needed to see that relationship differently and then to grow from that. A year in California then drove, this is where the road trip came, (laughs) the cat, I had two cats at the time then, I drove from California back to Virginia with two cats in a car. (laughs) That was it. (laughs) Okay, I have to ask a logistical, yeah, I have to ask a logistical question. Yeah. Are they in carriers in the car? Yeah. And then, and then how does the litter box situation work? Yeah. So the, the California trip, the, the other cat was such a wild little animal. She's, she was the best, but she was wild. Like she wasn't a great traveler. She was very loud if I needed. So they were in, I got like this cat playpen and put it in the back seat of my car (laughs) <laughs> and that's where they stayed the whole day on those trips from California back to Virginia. It took five or six days. Oh my um, goodness. And so, yeah, that was a whole like story in and of itself, getting them in and out of the cat playpen into oh. their cat carrier to carry them into the hotel. And there was one hotel that I kind of snuck them in, but I had to take Karma, the, sec- the other one, I had to take her like the back stairs because she was meowing the whole time. And I'm like, you're not even supposed to be in here. Quiet. I'm like envisioning you with like a coat over them, yeah. like creeping yeah. in the back door in the dark. Kind of. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of how it went with her. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they didn't need the litter box. They had. I had a litter box in the front seat on the passenger side on the floor. But the California trip, they never used it. Really? Even though, I mean, like, I would let them out when we stopped to take breaks and stuff, and they never used it because they didn't, typically they get, they don't eat or drink a lot when you're traveling with them, mm-hmm. and that's okay. But the 
the trip with Panther this past summer, I did the same thing, but she, since I knew she was a good traveler and she was going to try to get under my feet and, uh, I let her out of the carrier as soon as we got in the car and she would typically go in the back seat and just lie on the just towel that I had back down. She did use the litter box a couple of times while I was driving. I think that was because of her kidneys. Like she did it, but she, it was, it all worked she out great. great. She did, she did great. great. Yeah. She had a really beautiful send off. You she guys did. going on this, yeah. this long trip together. I just, yeah, it was uh, my animal communicator friend said she will be talking about this trip for eons. And I was like, look, I'm getting teared oh, up now. Lori, I love she's, that. She, yeah, she was. Amazing. I'm an animal person and I, I've only, I'm only on my second cat. I didn't have cats growing up. They were like barn cats at my um, family farm, but you know, they're not the same, they Yeah, yeah. Cool, but they're not the same. Yeah. But yeah, my, my 18 year old kitty, I always say he's my soul kitty. Yeah. And I'm yeah. convinced that he came back again. <laughs> now we have a cat named Moose, but I'm an animal person. So yeah. I feel. I feel well, actually that. this, my animal communicators that friend said, Panther and I were in another life together. She was a dog. She was my dog and she wow. was like a companion dog. Oh yeah. Well, I, love cool. it. So, oh, I love it. So yeah. I want to rewind just a little bit to it like with this, I'm fine thing. Yeah. Because it's, there's like different versions of that, you know, there's like, I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, life is fine. Right. So were you, which were you, you know, was it like, there was a lot going on inside and you were just kind of like, I'm fine. I'm just, I'm just going to keep moving. I'm going to keep yeah. doing. Yeah. Um, or maybe both. Yeah. Well, it was both. I mean, there were a lot of good times in the marriage, but I think for a, a long time, we both knew that it wasn't serving. The relationship wasn't serving us good people. He's a, he's an amazing person. And I have nothing but good things to say about him. Now it just wasn't, we weren't good together anymore, but we wanted to make it work and we kept doing things to try to make it work, but it wasn't, we were just growing differently. We're different people. And so getting to that point where I don't think he would have ever initiated, I had to do it. And it was so hard. I so, can't imagine. So hard. That's what I, but my soul needed that growth. Like that's the the thing that people are not hearing when you feel uncomfortable, when you're saying everything's fine and kind of stuffing things down, that's your soul talking to you trying to get your attention to say, Hey, I need growth because that's what our souls are here for growth. And I'm not getting it and I need it. And some people it'll come out as a physical ailment. And some people it'll come out as, um, like I had a guest on my podcast and she knew she needed to leave her job. She had been there, I think like 10 or 15 years. And she was even taking courses to become a coach, but she wasn't leaving her job because it was fine. It's fine. And then one day she missed a sales quota and they fired her. So the universe will do whatever it needs to do yeah. to get you to listen. Eventually you'll get a kick in the pants if, yeah. you don't, if you don't take action. I do. I do believe that. I think yeah. the discomfort just grows and grows and grows. And if we continue to try to hold back where our soul wants to expand, eventually it's like some, something breaks loose yeah. and we end up transitioning, whether we like it or not. And it's usually pretty uncomfortable. <laughs> exactly. I was just going to say, usually if you're forced into it, it's not comfortable. It's not yeah. comfortable either way, but it's more uncomfortable. If you aren't listening in it, you have to be like hit over the head with a yeah. two by four. So yeah, my experience was just, uh, okay, this is, it's time. Like it's time. Mm -hmm. It's time. I think that your message is very similar to mine and that is, or the same. And that is that that discomfort isn't to be ignored yeah, and it is to be honored and to investigate it. Um, I'm a huge, huge fan of gratitude practices as well, but going back to the beginning of our conversation with like the gratitude list, I have seen so many people and particularly women living the I'm fine life and living the writing the gratitude journal life, but they're still not feeling anything. Right. 
And right. that to me is the place where I want to be like, no, <laughs> yeah. let's do this differently, you know? And yeah. I can see why they do because they don't know, like they're doing the best they can to just be grateful, right. but they're not paying attention to the discomfort. So it's like creating almost like a dissonance. Yes. And the other thing is when you can see all the things you have to be grateful for, a lot of times people will say, well, I have all of this. What's wrong with me? Yes. Why can't I be happy? I have all of this good stuff mm -hmm. and I'm still feeling this dissonance. So what's wrong with me? Like, am I not appreciative? Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. And then they beat their self, themselves up for that. Totally. Yeah. And also isolate because I must be the only one who, you know, if I tell anybody that I'm not feeling, I'm feeling yeah. less than fine. Mm -hmm. And yet I have all of this amazing things in my life. Mm -hmm. They're going to, you know, not believe me. They're going to say I'm, uh, an, in, in great, what, ingrateful, yeah, ungrateful, ungrateful person, unappreciative, like, ungrateful. unappreciative. Yeah. 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 It's, it's this icky cycle. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think people do end up sick, ignoring, ignoring yeah. that and, um, and end up in cycles of self-loathing and, guilt and shame and all of it. So I love, I love what you're out there teaching. So yeah, just thank you. Carry on friends. <laughs> <laughs> carry on. Let me see if there's anything. I feel like I did want to ask you about your program, the fuck being fine, the, the transform yeah. from chaos to peace, no matter what is happening around you. What does that program look like? If somebody is going to enter into it, is it a one-on-one -on -one thing or is it a pre-built? It is both. So it can be private client and there is a group program as well. So uh, small groups, no more than 10 people in a group. And within the Fuck Being Fine program, there's what I call the trilogy for success. And the trilogy is gratitude, connection, and courage. So gratitude exercises, we start out with, you know, values and figuring out what, what's important to you, the values, what you say you value is how does your calendar match that and taking through decision-making and then into and some exercises on how to become more grateful, more to see gratitude and feel gratitude more naturally. And then the connections to yourself, your, uh, well, to your friends, your family, your colleagues, community, and most importantly, yourself. And that's where that meditation piece comes in and getting in touch with your connection to yourself and your higher power. And then you can have those two things as your foundation. And then you, you still need to find the courage to do the thing that you know you need to do and like leave a marriage or leave a job or, and it doesn't necessarily have to be that dramatic. It could be just allowing yourself to recharge, mm -hmm. but finding the courage to do that. So that's what those three pieces look like. And it's typically an eight week program. Eight weeks. Okay. It sounds wonderful. How can people find you if they're if they're interested, if they're looking to connect with you? Yeah, zenrabbit.com is the best place to find me. And I have an, uh, a guide there called The Five Easy Ways to Start Living a Sabbatical Life. And that can be Beautiful. downloaded on zenrabbit.com. I love it. Very cool. Thank you so much for your time, Lori. This has been really, My really pleasure. fun. And um I will definitely be doing more looking at Zen Rabbit and what you have to offer. And it's just been really lovely to connect. It has. Thank you so much, Kelly.